this art from George is the same as this drawing here. Okay, so I'm going to encourage you to think like an engineer and think what would you do to move the wrist and fingers? How many tendons would you need and what would you call them? So anatomists came up with a very simple system. When they came across a muscle or a tendon, they would look at, okay, what movement does it perform if you contract the muscle? So they would name it by the movement first, then they would say what it moves, whether it's moving the wrist, which is the carpus, or the fingers, which is the digitorum, or the thumb, which is the pollicis. And then finally, if there was two of them, they'd have to decide, well, will we name it after the shape or the length? So if it's longer, we'll call it the longus. If it's shorter, we'll call it brevis. If it's deep, we'll call it profundus. And if it's superficial, we'll call it superficialis. So if you think about it, you're going to need structures that move the wrist and they're going to need to finish at the wrist so that their action is on the wrist, okay? If you're going to move the fingers, you need the tendons to extend all the way to the end of the fingers. Um, but fingers are very special, okay? Sometimes they need a spare tire uh, and occasionally there's two of everything. So let's start with the flexor side and I'm just going to try and keep it simple for you. Okay, the common flexor origin as it's known is the medial epicondyle of the humerus, okay? And a lot of things hang off there. And if you are um, going to move the wrist, okay, you're going to need something to hang off there and finish at the level of the carpal bones, okay? So this one here on the outside of the wrist is your flexor of what? Carpi. And we're going to name it after the side it's on. It's near the ulna. So flexor carpi ulnaris, that's your first one. Mirror that over to the other side. We're going to originate on the medial epicondyle and come down there to the base of the second metacarpal. And this is your movement, flexor, carpi, and then radialis because it's on the radial side, okay? Now, anything in the middle would be a logical place for a muscle tendon running to the fingers to go, okay? So in the middle of those is a digitorum, okay? So a digitorum applies to these four fingers, not the thumb, remember? So we've got four digitorum tendons. And in this case, we've got a double set, okay? So we've got uh, a superficial one, which originates here, here, and here. So a nice big broad muscle. And that extends all the way down to these four digits, stopping on the middle phalanx of each of those four digits. Deep to that is a backup or a spare tire. The flexor digitorum profundus, which originates here, runs deep and this time runs all the way to the tip of the fingers, okay? So the two movements they produce, the profundus does this, which is a bit gross, and the superficialis does this, okay? So it stops on that joint there. So I think we've got the pattern for the naming. So if it's on the outside, it's going to be a flexor carpi something. If it's in the middle, it's going to be a flexor digitorum, okay? Now we've got to talk about another movement that the forearm produces, which is pronation, okay? So pronation, we're going to have two pronators, one that's here, going to here. So pronator teres, and the other one is down the bottom, and that's shaped like a square, so pronator quadratus, nice and easy. Okay, so the other thing you should understand is the forearm is divided into three layers, the superficial layer, intermediate layer, and the deep layer. Okay, but you can go and study those yourself, what's in each of those layers. Uh, we need to talk about the thumb. So the thumb is special, it has its very own tendon, it originates here, and goes all the way to the tip of the thumb, and it's called the flexor of what? The pollicis. And in this case, we call it the longus, okay? Because there are some extra muscles in the palm of the hand, um, which we need to distinguish it from. So now if you flip that over, so we're on the dorsal side of the forearm. On the dorsal side, these muscles are gonna be capable of producing extension of the wrist and the fingers, okay? So this time we're starting a lot of these tendons at the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and this is known as the common extensor origin okay you'll need to know which things make up that common extensor origin so we're going to put a tendon on either side of the wrist over the ulna and over the radius and they're responsible for straightening the wrist so coming from here and going down to here is the extensor 
carpi ulnaris, named after the bone. On the opposite side will be the extensor carpi radialis, nice and easy. Anything in the middle is going to be a digitorum, okay? So starting here, we've got the extensor digitorum running down and dividing into four. And they insert, those slips insert onto the metacarpophalangeal joint into the extensor hood or the extensor expansion as it's known. So uh, one other thing I need to mention is that the extensor carpi radialis, there's actually two of them, okay? So originating just above the CEO is the extensor carpi radialis longus. It's longer, so we call it the longus. So it's gonna go all the way from here down to here, okay? So the extensor carpi radialis brevis inserts on the third metacarpal. The extensor carpi radialis longus inserts on the base of the second metacarpal. And one of the ways you can remember that is if you turn your hand into anatomical position, which is palms forward, down by your side, the brevis version is going to be closer to your backside. That's how you can remember it. So, so far we've covered the two extensor carpi tendons, well three, because I've just told you about the longus. And in the middle, the extensor digitorum is just a nice simple extensor digitorum. There's no third word in this case, because there is no deeper layer, there's just one. Okay, but the dorsal side of the wrist, you've got to think about all the special movements we want to perform. Your pinky is a bit special. The fifth digit can do some extra stuff. The index finger is pretty tricky, and the thumb is also very dexterous. So we need to have some extra tendons for that. Starting with the fifth digit, we've got an extensor digiti minimi. Okay, so it's a little tiny slip of tendon, which makes it look like there's five extensor tendons, but actually the fifth one has its own name, extensor. Digiti, minimi, minimal digit, very tiny, still a digit, so you can see why it's been named that digiti minimi. Okay, then the th the index finger. So we call that the extensor indices. Okay, so in this case we leave out the word digitorum. So the extensor indices it starts here on the ulna, originates, and then comes down into the second digit. <coughs> extensor indices. And then the thumb. So the thumb uh, has some special functions. So abduction of the thumb, let's just clarify, this is abduction. Extension looks more like that. So abduction is forward. So if you do that on your own wrist, you might see a large fat tendon just stick out at the front. This is abductor pollicis, and we call it longus. Okay, so that's this one. Originates here, inserts there on the base of the first metacarpal. Then you have an ex a double set of extensors, okay? So extension is this again. So the one that starts higher and travels further all the way to the tip is the extensor pollicis longus. The next one you can name yourself. Movement first, extensor of what? It extends the thumb, so we call it pollicis. And it wasn't the longest version, so it must be the short version, which is the brevis. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's how you name things. Movement first, of what, and then side or shape, longest brevis, superficialis, deep. Okay, then if you think about the movement we talked about on this side was pronation, you need something to oppose that and bring it back. So you have a supinator. Uh, and then the final one we talk about is one muscle that crosses the elbow joint and crosses the wrist joint, and it's the brachioradialis. Okay, so it starts above the lateral epicondyle and comes all the way down and inserts onto this distal radius. Okay, so it's a very long, slender muscle. But apart from that, everything fits a really nice pattern. Okay, and you should be able to take that home and learn all these origins and insertions. Uh, but at the end of the day, when it comes to being a sonographer, you need to be able to follow a uh, muscle from where it starts and where it goes, and then you can work out the name of it. Okay.